process of electing the, chap the acting chairperson. So members, um, after welcoming you, I would like to facilitate that process by requesting you by show on um, by pressing the, the mic to to indicate who will be to indicate your nomination for the acting chairperson. I therefore request the members in the meeting to indicate uh, the nomination of the acting chairperson to to facilitate the proceedings of these um, meetings this evening. Thank you very much. I therefore request members to indicate their um, member nomination for the acting chairperson. Thank you very much. Members, uh, do you want um, who is there any nomination for for the acting chairperson in the absence of the chairperson? Yes, um, it's, it's honourable Chris here. I would like to nominate Honourable Gillian as the chairperson. Okay. Uh, Honourable Gillian, you've been elected, uh, nominated by member Christians. Is there anyone who would like to second uh, Ms. Uh, member Gillian's nomination? Uh, thank you. I'm Honourable yes. Malika. I yes, want Mama. To the nomination of Honourable Gillian. Okay, there is a second. Uh, there is a secondment of uh, of the, the of the nomination for member Gillian. Is there any further nomination in the house? Uh, if not, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Honourable Gillian for taking this opportunity as the acting chairperson to facilitate the proceedings of this evening's meetings. I therefore give the opportunity to you to take the meeting over to welcome and, and, and other proceedings. Thank you very much. Over to you, Honorable Gillian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me also, before we start the meeting, just draw to your attention that I am also struggling with my connection. <clears throat> so um, let's hope that the connection will keep. Um, but thank you to the members for putting your trust in me to chair this meeting. Um, I will ask the committee secretary just to flag for us the agenda, please. I don't have the agenda. Maybe the committee, uh, the coordinate advisor might be in the position to have an agenda with her or the IT person because I've just been drawn in, in, Did you in the hear 11th me? hour. Yes, Chairperson. Um, I just want to check from the content advisor Hello. or the IT. Hi, Chairperson. Maybe I must maybe I must switch off my camera because my connection yes. is very bad. Can you hear me, Chair? Am I audible, members? Okay. Yes, you are audible. Um, uh, I was dra drawn in in the 11th hour. I don't have any documentation with me. Can I request the content advisor or the IT person to assist us by screening the agenda of today's meeting? Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hi, honorable Jamie, what's wrong? 
I've got a Sorry, problem. I'm I'm right, I hear you now. Okay, I've, I've made a request for the content advisor to assist the committee no. by screening the agenda on the screen. I, I don't have any documentation with me. Can he flight the agenda? Hi, good people. Thank you. Am I in the meeting? You are in the meeting, Chairperson. Oh, thanks. So. Yep. And where are we? <laughs> Yo. Hey, hey. Chairperson, while you were failing to connect, we were trying to. As, that as the, as, the Okay, as the meetings, are we making a quorum? Let's just check first. Are we making a quorum for the meeting? Or have you started already? Yes, Chairperson, you are making a quorum. While you were trying to connect, we said Honorable Gillian must continue, but now we are waiting for the agenda to be on the screen that you then you can. We can start. Okay. The department. Hello. Is the department meeting? Hello. At first. Yes, the department is here. Yes, Chair. Oh. The department presented here. Oh, oh good. Good evening, Chris. Uh, 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 Minister DM and the team, good evening. Can somebody fly the, the agenda? Yeah, no, this is terrible. Uh, good evening, Chairperson. I tried to get some information yes, for, from Nolutando. Uh, as far as the presentation is concerned, uh, she's struggling because she's experiencing the load shedding. She told me that today's briefing is the briefing by the Department of Higher Education and Training and the National Student Funds Association uh, uh, AIDS Associ uh, Scheme by uh, NFSAS on their ad adjusted NFSAS. budget. NFSAS on their adjusted budget. Yes, the... the Um, thank you. I'm good. Uh, yeah, no, that is the agenda. We this agenda was sent to us before. Honorable members, I'm going to have to connect in the car because it's uh, the the lights are really bad outside. Uh, or maybe should I switch my, my video off? Okay then. Um. I think we should we should start with we should start with the meeting. We'll start first with the department. Um, let me welcome let me welcome everybody. Welcome honourable members and welcome the minister and the, the team. Um, we are meeting still under this uh, cloud. Yeah, uh, code code COVID COVID nineteen and. Uh, it's not only COVID-19 that is attacking us now. Like we're having a problem with the uh, electricity and all our um, the community secretary. There is load shedding in her area, and she so she cannot be with us and even help us in flight in the information. Um, I'll. I so say we'll start with the department and then we'll end with uh, NSFAS. Is that in order? So that the minister, when he opens, will open the meeting for everyone. Then later we can move into to discuss the NSFAS uh, presentation. Is that in order? Uh, 
Uh, Chairperson, uh, yeah. I understand the minister, the minister has submitted the apologies to um, uh, leading the team of the Department of Higher Education and Training, as well as uh, members or officials from the National Students Financial Aid Scheme, which is led by the administrator. So all those officials uh, are here. Uh, our Deputy Minister is leading the charges. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Welcome, DM. Um, it doesn't change anything. Um, the the ministry is represented, and the department is here, and NSFAS. Um, we I think we should start with the presentation, and bearing in mind that we are having uh, this infrastructure uh, problem, you know, uh, electricity, and of course. This uh, facility we are using is not very, very user friendly. Um, or is it because we are used to the other system than this one? Um, the, we are discussing the medium, you know, there's a presentation to look at the, the, the adjusted uh, budget for the Department of uh, Higher Education, and of course, and all its entities will be affected. But of particular interest to us as the NCOP will be the NSFAS. Um, they are, the NSFAS is doing very well uh, from, from what we have noticed over a long period of time. And uh, yeah, uh, we wish them luck going forward. We know. Uh, they will always, you know, they say, they say, because I say, saying it, so, or something like that. Uh, may I give over to you, DM, to, to lead us in the presentation, open the meeting. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, if if what is it was uh, agree DG, with the agenda. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, DM is also struggling, you know, with the connection. Uh, quite a few officials, including our CFO, uh, they are hit by power outage uh, load shedding at the present moment. So they are not with us, uh, but we are ready to proceed with the presentation if uh, the chairperson allows that to happen. Um, let's hear from the members, because um, if the DM is not in the... Is the DG in? Yes, the DG is in. Okay. Uh, we can hear from the members. Members, do we let the DG make the presentation, or we start with NS first, and later we, the, the department can make a presentation later, because NS first is here. We're yeah, following we, we the meeting to... We are here, Chair, as the department, uh, together with the NESFAS. So we are all led by our executive uh, authority, such that uh, these technical problems uh, are actually hitting us now because DM is disrupted, you know, completely. Uh, but he continues trying. So we'll see how it goes. But we are ready uh, to kickstart the presentation if. Uh, the chairperson and the honourable members do allow us to do so. Okay, uh, in the light of that, um, then let us give the department to give a presentation and the minister will join later, the, the, the DM will join later and I don't think it changes anything. Uh, except that when we ask questions, it will be important for the ministry to be in the meeting so that uh, you know we can engage deeper with some of the questions that may need their answers particularly is that in order honorable members if we let the yeah we let the uh, the dg to make the presentation and the and the dm will join us on the way um in the light of no objection to that i'll say uh, um dg uh, we we are all yes. No, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will ask Faisal to put up uh, the the presentation on the screen. 
Can you put the presentation, uh, Faisal, uh, with the permission of the chairperson and the honorable members? Yeah, just just a few seconds, uh, Chair. We are loading. We are putting up the presentation. Okay. Is it visible, DJ? Not yet. Visible now? Yeah, now it's visible. Now it's visible. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Fizel. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Chair and the members, uh, we are presenting on a special adjustment budget uh, as presented uh, by the Minister of Finance uh, is for the 2020-21 financial year. As we all know that the Minister of Finance tabled a special adjustment uh, budget in Parliament on the 24th of June 2020. Uh, these adjustments to the original tabled estimates of National Treasury were required uh, due to the impact of COVID-19 uh, pandemic on government, uh, government revenue uh, and expenditure, as well as the economy as a whole. Uh, honorable members would uh, recall that uh, the economy uh, of our country has contracted by 7.2%, uh, which has shot up unemployment uh, to exceed at a faster rate uh, the 30% uh, a figure it was hovering around uh, for some time. Now it's in the 40s. During the interrogation process of the possible adjustments, the budget of the department, uh, the National Treasury indicated that each department must declare a cut of 20%. So all government departments were required to cut their budgets. Uh, for about 20% in order to fund uh, the shortfall uh, of the 500 billion that the president announced, which we had to cough up uh, about 180 billion. So that was then to be realized through cutting the budgets of all government departments by 20%. Now, in the case of the department, the amount uh, is 19.5 billion. However, uh, as a department, uh, we put up an argument which was accompanied by information on the implications of such a cut on the post-school education and training system, as well as the level of reprioritization and expenditure at institutional uh, level regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, including the support to students mainly through NESFAS. Next slide, Faisal. So the above exercise uh, resulted in the final reduction of the department's baseline to be much less than the indicative cut of 19.5 billion because we had to engage uh, in this process. The only government department that were exempt, uh, exempted from this cut uh, is the Department of Health, uh, defense, uh, police, as well as defense, because they are regarded as frontline uh, departments. But uh, in our case, we would have loved really to be classified as a, a frontline department because uh, of the work and the responsibilities that we have in the city. Now, the final, the final special adjustments uh, budget then for, for the department uh, for this uh, financial year amounted to 
9.857 billion rands after we have engaged. I will explain how then, then this 9.8 billion was actually distributed. Uh, the total suspension of funds uh, amounts to 6.734 billion, of which 4.999 billion is reallocated for reprioritization expenditure towards COVID-19 activities. Now, what the National Treasury did, they then said, all right, we are not going to take the 19.5 billion. We would rather reduce it to 9.857 billion. But still, we complained that it will create a huge harm in the system. They then said, all right, we will take it, but reallocate some of the funds on areas that have been reprioritized in the system. So, which were very much grateful about, about that. So, the net suspension uh, um, uh, then that uh, in the end happened amounts to 1.734 billion for normal voted funds. It means, therefore, in the end, the cut that got effected in the PSET system was only 1.734 billion rands, not the, the 19.5 billion. And the adjustment budget also provides for the reduced collection of skills levies uh, to the amount of 8.122 billion rands. Next slide. Yeah, therefore, the final adjustment of 9.857 billion is as follows. Suspension uh, of funds, which is 6.734 billion, less, that is, we are minusing the monies that were taken and then reallocated in areas that have been prioritized is 4.99 uh, uh, billion. The net suspension then ended up being 1.734 billion. The reduction in skills levy, that is the money which goes to the CITAS, Sector Education and Training Authorities, as well as National Skills Fund, uh, remained at 8.122 billion, which then the total decrease uh, is 9.856 billion. So based on the above, the department's original allocation of 2021 uh, reduces from, in the nutshell, from 116.857 billion to 107.0 uh, billion. Uh, that represents a reduction of 8% only not the 20% that was initially uh, imposed on us. So the biggest single reduction is on the declined estimates for the skills levy allocations from 19.413 billion to 11.291 billion. So a, re a reduction of uh, 8.122 billion, uh, which is 42%. Uh, Next slide, Faison. So therefore, the suspension uh, of 6.734 billion is made up of, these are the budgetary items, departmental operations, uh, 316 million NESFA subsidy, uh, 2.5 billion university block grants, 2.5 billion university infrastructure grants, 710 million TVET college operational su subsidies, uh, 312 million, uh, TVET College new campus operations, 15 million. Uh, TVET College infrastructure grant, 370 million. Then public entities, which is administrative costs, just 10 million, which is making up that 6.734 billion. Next slide, Faisal.
Next slide, Fraser. The slide has been shifted onto slide number six. Yeah. Uh, slide number six, yes. The reallocation then of 4.999 uh, billion, which is around a uh, 5 billion, if you like, is made up of NESFA subsidy. Yeah, NESFA subsidy devices, 2.5 billion. University block grants reallocated 2.117 billion. University infrastructure grant 210 million. TVET operations 162 million. Then new campuses uh, 10 million. The purpose of the reallocation of funds is to cater for reprioritized expenditure towards addressing COVID-19 related activities, including uh, student support. In addition, the budget provides for the shifting of 1.510 million within the department's operational budget for COVID-19 expenditure. Next slide, Fraser. Yeah. So based on the reallocation of this amount, the net suspension, therefore. Yes, Faisal, are we together? We are on slide seven now. Yeah. Uh, the department acknowledges the need for the... Uh, no, Faisal. Yeah. Yes, I've gone through this, Faisal. Uh, As because on slide this is, this is slide seven. Yeah, based, yes, that, that, that's fine. So the department acknowledges the need for the adjustments uh, announced by the, it's jumping up and down, Faisal, what is happening? I think it might be the connection, DG, or something. All right, can I just finish this slide, uh, which speaks about, yeah, it's jumping up and down now. All right, the, the, the departmental operations then, uh, in terms of the cuts, uh, is got some limitations. The restrictions on operations over the period April to June 2020 provides an opportunity to effect cuts where expenditure slowed down. Cuts are mainly effected uh, on items such as travel, accommodation, venues, and related services. Those softer areas where we could uh, manage cutting of funds. So the department is in the process uh, to amend then the APP as well as threat plan uh, in order to accommodate this impact of adjustments. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at the institutions, uh, sectors, the impact of this, so there is a substantial impact on the university sector due to the COVID-19 pandemic in relation specifically to protecting lives and saving the academic year, which we need to do simultaneously. So therefore, the reallocation of a portion of the suspended funds is supporting key initiatives in the sector. So the following areas uh, are highlighted. That, that is teaching, learning, and assessment. All universities have submitted multimodal teaching, learning, and assessment plans to enable them to complete 2020 academic year, taking into account the additional cost as a result of COVID. Funds were also reprioritized by institutions uh, from their block grants and earmarked grants to develop teaching and learning platforms to accommodate new ways of teaching and learning remotely. Uh, the, the department through university education branch 
had to work with each and every institution in refining uh, institutional plans of these institutions. And those engagements had to be undertaken with each and every individual institution because the plan uh, for them to work would have to uh, be based on the conditions and experiences that each institution is going through. So universities will then uh, be stalling some current approved projects uh, that are due uh, as a result of this reprioritization and cuts that got affected. So the estimated cost of 3.851 billion is applicable in this regard. Uh, all what we are saying in this slide, all universities developed the readiness plans, as I indicated, which were engaged uh, with the department. The proposed cuts are substantial and had to be accommodated within existing resources. An estimated cost of 1.879 billion is applicable. In respect to the infrastructure grant, the cut on the infrastructure and efficiency grant uh, will result in, post in the postponement of certain projects, as well as a slowing down uh, of, the, of some infrastructure program, including the student housing infrastructure program uh, in the future. But that hasn't happened as yet now. But as funds have been shifted from those areas uh, to reprioritize uh, funding, COVID-19 related uh, demands, uh, it will be felt uh, later, later on. Next slide, Faison. So this slide is mainly focusing on TVET colleges. In respect to teaching and learning, the impact of subsidy cut on the 2020 student enrollment relating uh, it is calculated at approximately 6,200 uh, lower in terms of headcount and enrollment. But due to the extensive impact of the lockdown, these students would not have been able to register during this period, thus making the impact on the TVET system a bit uh, minimal, because though that figure has been uh, projected, but because in the system uh, we are enrolling uh, yearly programs, uh, six monthly programs, and trimester systems. So in respect then to trimester uh, courses, uh, we're not able to register uh, other trimesters, which then had an effect in terms of the numbers. Uh, that would have been accommodated in the system. That's what uh, we are trying to say there. The main impact of the cut will be on the 2021 new student intake for the centers of specialization, as the funding that was due in January 2021 has been reprioritized for COVID-19 related expenditure. The centers of specialization is the ideal model of how a facility of a TVET college should actually be in terms of teaching, learning, as well as training. That would involve the participation of industry, whereby both students as well as lecturers would have time in the industrial field in order to gain the experience which would make them to be better qualified uh, graduates and artisans. The new campus operations, that is the net cut, is based on unallocated resources to colleges due to the delays in the finalization of projects and will therefore uh, not have a negative impact on operations. Next slide, Faisal. There is sufficient infrastructure funding at the college level to continue with existing projects and the cut will not uh, affect the system uh, immediately. 
uh, will see as the time goes on. In respect to community education and training uh, colleges, there are no adjustments uh, that have been effected here because you can talk of uh, a belt tightening. Uh, if you do that, you'll cut them into half. That would be a serious disaster because their budget is very low uh, in terms of the baseline allocation from the National Treasury. Now, in respect to the entities, that is the operational co cost cuts on public entities are linked to information declared by entities for funded vacancies that could not yet be filled. The cuts on the entities should therefore not have a substantial impact on the operations of the entities as of now. Other operational factors could have a negative impact on entities or some entities, for example, slowed down operations that would generate revenue for the for the entities or particular entities. Next slide, Faisal. Now, if we look at SACWA, SACWA receives funds from baseline as well as self-generated income through the activities they do engage in in the service of other parties out there. Uh, for instance, COVID-19 lockdown has severely affected SACWA's ability to generate revenue from its income generation generating services, including the evaluation of foreign qualifications, verification of national qualifications, and to professional uh, bodies. Uh, this is estimated to be around 56% uh, in terms of the projected uh, annual income, which would be now severely impacted. So SACWA's experiences, SACWA at the present moment is experiencing difficulties uh, to balance its budget and the reduction and the reduction escalates these challenges uh, further. So as a department, uh, we're in the process of assisting SACWA to manage this situation. Uh, they are also unable to implement their plans uh, for automation. Uh, while no changes were made to the five-year targets uh, in East Strat plan for 2020 to 2025, SACWA has adjusted some of its quarterly targets and moved some of the APP targets for 2020 21 uh, financial year uh, to the following performance areas. Uh, that is, SACWA has earned only about 1.2 million to deal with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the situation is uh, a bit challenging here in respect to SACWA. Next slide, Faisal. Yeah, CHE, the reduction is around 1.424 uh, million. So they've reconfigured ways of working and greater productivity, uh, reach and cost effectiveness through remote working modalities. So they put investment uh, in the necessary ICT uh, architecture is therefore essential through budget reprioritization uh, so that the impetus uh, can be maintained in terms of uh, getting on with their operational activities. A further reprioritization of the budget was to equip all staff with computer and data devices as well as a time in order to be equipped to work remotely. So all COVID-19 protocols are adhered to as required. Uh, savings from meeting costs of governance uh, committees redirected to advice research and advice functions that they have to carry. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So a reprioritization of the budget is therefore underway uh, to optimize staffing and to initiate new research projects related to assessment teaching and learning and quality assurance under the remote emergency uh, teaching and learning mode. 
capacities also increased uh, in under provided areas such as national standards and reviews as well as institutional audits so a review is underway to balance core and non-core functions to achieve an appropriate ratio with a bias towards core functions so the program delivery outcomes and targets uh, are being reassessed and an appropriate revision uh, is going to be effected in due course next slide phaser now, in respect to NESFAS, I spoke on this, but they will be coming in as well later on. So adjustments include the suspension of 2.5 billion and reallocation thereof earmarked for student devices. So the reduction of 5.523 million of administration grant was effected. Uh, NESFAS, however, raised an objection regarding the suspension and reallocation of funds for student devices. Uh, this matter is currently being engaged with the National Treasury. Uh, the, re the reduced administration grant has been incorporated in compensation of employees. NASFAS therefore expects a decrease in the collection of recoveries due to the impact of COVID-19 on the economy as a whole. All KPIs, that is key performance indicators, are currently being reviewed for COVID-19 impact and details will be provided when available. So the administration budget has been reprioritized and an amount of 4.9 million has been earmarked to address the impact of COVID-19. NESFAS will require in our view, funding for the extension of the 2020 academic year, which is inevitable. This will be addressed by the department during the adjusted estimates uh, processes, uh, but the engagements have already started the National Treasury. At UCTO, they are managing the budgetary cuts and the indication which is coming from them is that the impact will be a bit more uh, minimal in their operation, operations. Uh, they are considering uh, their APP targets. Uh, six targets may require downward adjustment where envisaged numbers or turnaround time will be affected by the COVID-2019 and the resultant slow down thereof. So the adjustments will not negatively impact in the totality of their work. For instance, quality assurance uh, activities. So they've earmarked 2.680 million for COVID-19 actions uh, in order to cope with the demands for uh, PPEs, laptops, data, and also supporting their staff so that they are able to work remotely, but be kept uh, productive. Next slide, Faisal. Yes. Now, the impact on skills levy. The sector education and training authorities, uh, authorities, uh, they are having four months exemption in the skills development levy from 1st May 2020 to August 2020. In response to COVID-19, uh, this is constituting a tax relief measure which will negatively impact on various learning programs such, such as apprenticeships, learnerships, work integrated learning, as well as internships. We know that in some instances, learnerships and the apprenticeships are important uh, in respect to labor absorption of the graduates from the system because all indications and the studies that we conducted is that if you have been exposed to these programs, you get easily absorbed in the world of work. This will also impact on CITA's administration budget in terms of section 14.3b, as read with section uh, 3a, a, and 
143B of the Skills Development Act, uh, a sitter may not use more than 10.5% of the total levy, levies paid by the employer as allocated in the Act received in any year to pay for its administration costs in respect uh, of that financial year. Next slide, Fraser. Is it freezing? Oh, thank you. Now, uh, this slide, uh, including the two that are following, uh, they are only showing basically uh, the figures uh, in respect uh, to where the, the reductions uh, actually happened uh, that would uh, take us now to remain, if you look there at the bottom, with the 107.0 billion uh, instead of the initial amount that was allocated, which was 116.856 billion. So this is just an illustration uh, in respect to each budgetary item, which I alluded to earlier on. So this next three slides are only talking to, to those figures. So in the main, uh, Chair, with your permission, uh, that is the nutshell of the presentation of the Department of Higher Education and Training. Thank you very much. Uh, you, are, you, are more than, you are more than welcome. Um, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the DM in the meeting? Has the DM managed to connect? Uh, the latest that has been afforded to me, uh, they are having a blackout. So the load shedding is hitting them. Oh, no, thanks. I just wanted to check if he has joined and so that we give him a, a chance to say a word or, 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 or two. Are there additions maybe from the from your team, uh, DG? Those who want to make additions to the presentation? No, the presentation is uh, quite complete and the compact chair uh, will entertain uh, questions when honorable members are seeking clarity on some few areas. So we are all in your hands. Uh, our counterparts, Nesfas. Uh, I hear as well just to talk about the funds uh, that they are administering for our students. Okay. Um, honorable members, that's the presentation from the DG. The minister will join us when it's time for when he gets that opportunity, if they, for instance, the system allows him. Um, what do we do? Do we move into presentation by NSFAS and then we deal with them all at the same time. I need direction from the members. Um, Chair. Yes, Chair. As Honorable Christian speaking, I think that's a good idea. Let NSFAS um, continue with their presentation and then we'll ask all the questions. All right, thanks a lot. There's no contrary view to that one. Um, and as far as the great doctor, may you take us through your presentation and be in mind that we have a network problem and the lockdown and that our batteries are getting lower because some of us were connected to the women's uh, meeting. I was in that meeting also, which ended just an hour before this one. So you know, uh, be, be as brief and to the point as possible. Uh, over to you, uh, Doctor. Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Chabling, and um, good evening, members, uh, colleagues, DHED colleagues, and, and all other members in attendance. Uh, we will be briefed uh, because the DG has covered most of uh, the budget issues. We have presented quite a detailed presentation beyond uh, the, the request for this meeting, because we always think it's good for the uh, for committee to be informed as to what is our, the latest developments in this first. 
Um, I have loaded my presentation and I did that early um, so that we can um, so that we could we, we I don't have challenges when I need to put it up, but now it seems to disappear. Let me just quickly. Um, so in essence, uh, uh, honorable chairperson, um, this was, has been functioning throughout the lockdown uh, and we had to operate from a virtual operating model because we had to shut down our head office uh, due to the proximity of people there and of course the, 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 the number of call center agents that we have. And we have converted our call center to a virtual call center. Uh, despite uh, all of these inconveniences, uh, I do think that NISFAS managed to operate fairly well under, under these difficult conditions. And we all are working off-site. At the moment, I'm actually in Pretoria from working from my home. Um, we had to set aside some, some funds for, uh, the, for making this happen and for COVID-related activities like the sterilization of the building uh, and, and education. And we had to equip our call center agents with uh, with devices so that they can work from home. Um, that five million rand that cost, we reprioritized that because we had savings from the travel budget due to the fact that we, nobody was really allowed to travel. So we are very happy with that, uh, that we were able to get the funds over to students on a continuous basis, at least from NISFAS to the institutions. Um, and, and we make sure that we pay at the 25th of each month our funds over to institutions. Now, that is probably where the biggest challenge lies in this for us at the moment, is we have removed all commercial interests from the disbursement chain, we have removed all vouchers, but we are still relying by and large on institutions to pay onwards from us to the, to the student. Uh, that is creating an additional blockages and additional delays. Uh, we are. We have started this year with three TVET colleges, which we onboarded through a NISFAS wallet system, where we pay students directly. So those were only three colleges when we started, and those colleges indicated that they don't, because they, those colleges indicated that they did not have the capacity to pay the students. Over the lockdown period, that figure increased to 38 colleges. So we are paying 38 of the 51 colleges through the NISFAS wallet system. The other colleges are still doing the payments on our behalf and all the universities are paying on our behalf. Um, and as I said, that creates a challenge, especially during lockdown, for university staff and TVET staff to go to the colleges or to the to their head offices to make these payments. The way we are going to solve this uh, uh, is to have direct payments to students into the bank accounts going forward. And that will cut out all the intermediaries and hopefully a lot of the challenges that we are faced with getting money to students. Uh, we were ready to go on uh, in June, 1st of June, uh, but the Portfolio Committee advised us to go out of uh, although we had approval from National Treasury to do that. So that tender process is underway, and for the start of 2021 academic year, all college students will be paid through directly into the bank accounts, and this will form part of our outreach campaign as we start the recruitment for 2021. Uh, and then uh, 2022, all university students will be paid directly. Uh, I am still insisting with the team that we should bring that also forward to 2021. Uh, and um, it, there is a, and I, we're really pushing hard because even in some universities, we have challenges getting money through to students. So we have divided our, um, our presentation up in different parts. So the first part, I'd just like to give some feed on the payments that if you look at the funding state statistics for universities uh, thus far we have uh, paid uh, uh, we have uh, received uh, when we say provisionally funded it means uh, students that were approved by NISFAS but as you know uh, chairperson you only become funded once we receive your registration data in other words if you register at the institution so for 2020, we have uh, approved 528,000 students. We have received uh, 465.9 um, uh, registrations we have received. Um, and we have the, our projected disbursement is 27.6 billion. Um, we have successfully paid 460,000. Now the difference, and this slide is slightly out of date because we have improved quite a bit on this. But the difference from uh, the 5,000 difference are students that we receive registrations for, that there are problems with their IDs, there are mismatches with their IDs as we check them with Home Affairs, 
or they are registered for the uh, for courses that are not funded by NISFAS, like postgraduate courses or uh, other courses. But like I said, uh, we have worked through our virtual machine uh, through our virtual platform, and that has been reduced to about a thousand. So this slide is slightly outdated, but be that as it may, the main point of the slide is that if you look at the increase in university funding by NISFAS from 2018 to 2019 it was a 5% increase, but from 2019 to 2020, it's a 20% increase. So there is a significant jump in NISFAS beneficiaries at university. And the last figure that I saw says that we are funding 42% of all university students. Um, and if you go to TVETs, we are funding over 70% of all TVET students. The next slides I'll skip through because these are just some of the challenges that we experience. Um, um, private accommodation and uh, N plus two criteria. We have we are listing this merely for the reason to, to show that these are some of the challenges, but we have addressed all of them. And in the interest of time, Chairperson, I'll skip over them. I'm quite happy to come back to them uh, for, for when we go into the question uh, sessions. So these, these are issues. Uh, if you go then to the TVET, uh, sorry, these are the other funders. As you know, we also administer funding for, uh, for funders other than THET, like the Funza Lusaka, um, 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 Funza Lusaka bursary scheme for teachers and some of the CETA uh, bursary schemes. And there we're also doing very well. Uh, this was also a very neglected function in this first. Um, so if you go then to uh, TVITS, um, as I said, this um, challenges that we, this is either funders, no, what has happened to this TVITS slide? But uh, perhaps I could just quickly speak to that while I ask the team to, does this uh, to look at for the TVET slide? This this presentation is a is a previous version, it seems. So in the TVET environment, as I've described, uh, we have um, paid uh, the 38 colleges through the um, through the wallet system, and that seems to be working fairly okay. Although there are also challenges, that most students in that environment gets their money. The growth in the TVET year on year is not as steep as that of the universities. Um, but we are seeing a bigger flow towards the TVET uh, uptake for um, for uh, uptake for for, for, for skills-based training, and I think uh, I want to just put this in context. The reason why I'm quoting these figures is because we see a growing uptake of NISFAS uh, in the TVET and both the TVET and both the university environment, and we can expect, therefore, that to, uh, given the post-COVID period as uh, the people lose jobs and the economy is tougher, that this demand will increase. We have modeled uh, the demand going forward and we are sharing that together with um, with, with the department. Um, the, um, I will find the, the, the TVET slide and I will come back to it, but in the interest of time, I will ask my colleague to talk about, to talk to part B, Mr. Prakash Mangri. He's, a, he's our financial person in the administration. Um, and he will address the budget implications of um, of of the adjusted budget, and also the impact of uh, the budget on uh, extending the academic year for 2020. Mr. Prakash uh, Mangre, can you please take over? Uh, thank you, Administrator. Good evening, Honourable Chairperson. Good evening, Honourable Members, and uh, good evening to our dear colleagues of the department. Of and of NISFAS. Um, if you go to the next slide there, please, Administrator. Thank you. So, uh, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members, what we see on this slide is then the impact of uh, an extension to the 2020 academic year. In the fourth column from the left, uh, you will see the grant um, for the current academic year, that's 28.5 billion, and on the assumption that there is a three-month extension to the university academic year, then NISFAS is uh, uh, proposing and positioning that we will be needing an extra 4.3 billion rand to be able to pay the various allowances to the uh, students. It excludes tuition, 
which is a subject uh, that is being concluded between the department uh, and the institutions themselves uh, to ensure that the current tuition included in the current allowance will be sufficient uh, to cover the extended period. So in short, um, uh, NISFES would be needing an extra 4.3 billion rand to fund uh, an extension of the uh, university 2020 academic year. If we go to the next slide, please, uh, Administrator. Administrator, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, Mr. Bangre, did it move? I did change it. Yes, it, it has now. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, uh, honorable chairs and honorable members, on this slide, we see the impact of an extension of the uh, academic year for TVET colleges on the assumption that uh, there is an additional two month extension to the academic year, then the impact of that would be 813 million rand. The grant for the current academic year is uh, 6.7 billion rand. Thank you. Let's uh, go to the next slide, please, Chairperson. Um, sorry, admin Administrator. Honorable Chairperson, honorable members, then the impact of um, the budget uh, announcements, the supplementary budget uh, that uh, the Minister of Finance announced fairly recently. On this slide, you, you we will show you the change in the revenue uh, from what was presented to the committee previously. And uh, there's a change on the line where you see a highlight from 0 0.3 billion Rand to 0 0.4 billion Rand. There were three changes uh, insofar as this was concerned. The first was that um, the minister approved um, the grant for administration from the 1st of April until the end of administration of um, 7.8 million Rand. The second was an additional once off grant of uh, 36.1 million Rand to cover uh, additional once off expenditure. And the third was a reduction uh, of 5.5 million Rand in the grant for the current financial year. So that 5.5 million Rand reduction was a direct impact uh, of the um, announcement by the Minister of Finance. Next slide, please, Chairperson, uh, please, uh, Administrator. On the expenditure slide, similarly, um, there's a slight increase in the expenditure and that uh, results from the additional grants that were received. 7.8 million was for the extension of the administration until the 20th of August. The four elements that made up that additional one-self expenditure, the first one related to 10.3 million Rand, and that was in respect of disbursements uh, to TVET colleges in related to the USSD charges that uh, the students incurred. The second was an amount of 10.8 million Rand for additional contact center consultants to address the 2020 academic year registrations. The third was an additional amount of 5 million Rand for forensic investigations, which the administrator will refer to a bit later in the presentation. And the fourth was to ensure occupational health and safety compliance uh, vis-a-vis -vis the court road premises of NISFES. And the, and the third adjustment was the reduction of 5.5 million Rand, which has been applied to the cost of staff uh, for the remainder of the financial year insofar as the positions have, that have not oh, yet been manned. Um, if we can go to the next slide, uh, please, Administrator. This slide, uh, Honorable Chairs and Honorable Members, merely reflects the change to the programs. The change was just on the one program and it was largely related to administration. Thank you. Next slide, please, Administrator. Here, Honorable Chairs and Honorable Members, um, is a challenge that uh, NISFES is experiencing 
which is the uh, which is the outcome of the supplementary budget announcement and the revised allocation letter that was received um, uh, from from the national treasury the revised allocation letter which we received on the 3rd of july uh, honorable chairs and honorable members has an onerous condition in it and it is an onerous condition that nisfes cannot comply with without disastrous consequences if we are forced to apply it then there will be what we anticipate as disastrous consequences the 2.5 billion rand suspension that was referred to earlier in the presentation by the dg of the department uh, and the earmarking of that for student devices cannot be implemented and the reason for that is that the full original student grant funds are required for the normal 2020 academic year disbursements it's the slides that we saw earlier where 28.5 billion rand for university and uh, 6.6 .6 billion rand for tvet colleges the full amount is needed so if we had to then suspend and remove 2.5 billion rand in simple terms uh, it is then saying that we will no longer be able to pay 2 and a half billion rand of allowances which would be due and payable to students and nisfes has made a recommendation from its original submission in april and consistently through the period has engaged the department has engaged national treasury and it's made uh, two proposals the first uh, related to the use of 2.1 billion rand of recovered funds to be utilized for the university students and recovered funds is simply the amounts that we've been able to recover from loans that were advanced in prior periods to students and uh, where there's a recovery in each year annually there's a recovery of a, in the order of uh, uh, 600 million rand per year and uh, the second proposition was to use 1.5 billion rand of uh, accumulated unused tvet funds to fund the once off um, costing for the students uh, devices dhet the department is engaging national treasury on this onerous condition nisfes had in its submission to the ddg of public finance at the national treasury made representation but we were informed that the representation needs to be made via the department which we subsequently did and the matter currently stands at that stage uh, chair so right now as we speak uh, it is an onerous condition that cannot be implemented without the consequences as i've described thank you chair that covers um, the in, in in summary the cost for an extension to the 2020 academic year on the one hand and uh, the impact of um, the budget uh, cuts and reprioritization thank you chair uh, thank you, Mr. Mangri. Uh, Chair, uh, so this is the appropriate time, therefore, for me to just uh, go into the, the some discussion, not some explanation of the de uh, de uh, devices that we aim to provide to all NISFAS beneficiaries. Um, as you all will now uh, recall, in the case of universities, students are receiving a learning material allowance, which was some people refer to it very loosely as the book allowance, and that is a 5,200 rand per year. Now, even before COVID, we have been encouraging some institutions or some universities to apply to apply that money to a laptop or, or digital devices and data to enhance, like any other countries or most other countries in the world, to enhance the classroom experience beyond the, just the classroom so that students are able to go into other learning materials that we can find in the cloud space and in other, and, and other platforms. And some universities actually did that. And so when COVID hit us, uh, universities uh, had already that had already paid out this learning material allowance to their students, requested NISFAS to assist them with uh, uh, as to how they could um, get access to digital devices. Uh, and after we did some very careful analysis, we agreed that we can do that on one basis, that we want to recover the, this again. So the 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 deal with universities is that we will provide you with a with a funds as Mr. Uh, Mangre has described of 2.5 billion rand, and but we will recover that from next year's learning devi learning device allocation, learning material allocation. 
And so, uh, with, of course, with some nuances, uh, it, we aim to have that to be a zero-sum game. In, in other words, it will pay for itself. Um, DHET did a survey throughout all the universities, and they have identified all the NISPA students. They have also identified those students that already received devices. And so those students that already received devices because they used the 2020 allowance will therefore not get uh, allowance, uh, will not therefore not get this uh, additional allowance. Um, and so uh, about from this, there's about 16 universities and just under 100,000 um, students already received their devices through the procurement mechanisms of those institutions. Um, and and uh, the remainder will therefore become part of the tender, which we have, which I will discuss in a minute. Now, in the case of TVETs, they never received learning material allowances. But because we made a recommendation to the minister and say that there had been underspending of TVET, NISPAS he would be in a position to make a once-off injection to fund the 2020 devices for TVET students. Um, and from next year onwards, there will be, have to be alternative sources of funding. And this is very uh, important progressive step, uh, Chairperson, because our skills development is technology-based. And therefore, for any TVET student to leave the institution with not having had access to digital devices is actually severe, uh, um, it's a severe undertraining, if I can use a word like that. Because all modern artisans and, uh, and technicians uh, should be able to open up a computer and work with it. We think of mechanics, we think of draftsmen that do their, their work on computers and digital devices. Um, and so, therefore, the total NISFAS population that we fund this year is over 700,000. I think it's about 720,000. And when we developed a model, we said that would cost us 3.6 billion rand. Now, of course, if you subtract all of those people that have received the devices already, uh, that figure will be uh, substantially less. Uh, we have then, uh, uh, on the advice of the minister, initiated a tender process. We consulted with the uh, National Treasury, with the Chief Procurement Officer, and after a very uh, long and hard um, discussions and debates, we were able to finalize the tender, put it out there, and the tender ended on the 13th, uh, two days ago. Uh, date. The, the tender termination date is on the 13th. We hope to have the tenders awarded by mid-August so that institutions can then start to procure uh, going into September. We know it's a long time, but uh, we had to go through all the PFMA requirements and all of the other legislative requirements. Uh, the tender is designed to encourage localization, uh, stimulation of uh, local economy. So we can't, we don't want people to import all of these computers. It's also strictly B, 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 e, e, one and two, and provision is also made for uh, supply chain management to benefit the country. So um, that is the status of, of this devices, and the device will become the own will, will become the ownership will be resting in the in the student. It will be his or her device. And we will also then take over the data provision from the initial project of DHET and build that into the learning material allowance going forward. Uh, of course, I'm trying to summarize as much as possible. There's, of course, a, a lot more to it. But um, uh, we are on track to provide these devices um, um, by, by sub September this year. Um, and like I said, we have assigned, we have developed memoranda of understanding with universities and institutions. Um, we have, in addition to um, to the banking project that I've just described, uh, uh, and as well as the laptop project, we have a number of innovations for for 2021. I won't go into all of the ICT readiness uh, slides that we have here, but we are comfortable, and I must stress this, Chairperson that although uh, the, the systems that, that NISFAS has at the moment is not really fit for purpose, we have made it sufficiently stable to carry us at least until we have a complete system overall in, in a year or two's time. So we are very comfortable that we have stabilized the system, we have built in this necessary checks, we have established a cybersecurity project with the CSIR. When we arrived at, when I arrived at NISFAS, 
the cybersecurity was less than zero. Uh, it was terrible. And um, we have now on a stage where we have control over our security and we are working closely with the CSIR on that. Um, um, so moving forward, um, our systems are, well, over the past two, uh, 18 months, I should say, the systems have been performing not as well as it should be, but relatively stable. We have also worked with the CSIR on determining um, uh, the, the hotspots, uh, the Wi-Fi coverage in South Africa, and this will assist us with our laptop rollout um, and will further assist, uh, hopefully, also our institutions to reach their students. And this is a very exciting project that we are, that we are busy with, with the CSIR. Um, the, this is an important part of the presentation. So, uh, the, it was, um, the this was, was placed under administration in August 2018. At that stage, it was anticipated that it will only be for one year. It became evident very quickly that another year is required. And Mr. Bl Minister Blade and Zamandi uh, requested me to stay on for a second year. That second year is coming on to an end at the end of August um, 2020, so in a month's time. And therefore, it's important that we discuss the transitioning from the administrator, um, um, from the administrator to a normal appointment. I have skipped over the terms of reference and the performance of, of the administration against the terms of reference, because that will come out in a lot more detail in our annual report. But if there are any questions around it, I'm happy to discuss it. So part of the transition of, from the administrator to, shall we call it, a normal governance structure for NISFAS as per the law, uh, the minister has just today advertised uh, uh, request uh, for nominations for the board of NISFAS. We have made a number of appointments. Uh, we have appointed a chief operations officer. Uh, it's a, it's a, and sorry for the terms, but for, for, for purposes of clarity, she's a black female. Uh, she's, she assumed duties on April 2020, and that is a key, key appointment. Uh, in that operation space, we have also made an appointment of a general manager responsible for TVET. It's also a black female. And we have developed a complete division, which was previously absent from NISFAS, that will dedicate its attention to the processing, applications, and outreach into TVETs. Um, and, and that is uh, starting to work very well because the TVET sector is now getting the necessary attention that it should get. Uh, the chief information officer, uh, we have initiated a process of recruitment. We did not find a candidate, but I have a um, one of the advisors that uh, that assisted me. She is acting in it. Is also a black female. Is Dr. Sibon Gesini, um, and um, uh, I, I am in talks with her to to take on a contract post for one or two years to make sure that we don't lose this expertise, but also to provide her with the space to hand over to a uh, successor. Uh, and she's done marvelous work. She's made all the top appointments and all the top appointments are, uh, are equity candidates, black, uh, two black females, uh, two black males, and, um, and I think one uh, colored male. Uh, and already we can see the massive difference in the IT space now that is properly capacitated with the correct technical, uh, uh, technical personnel. The chief corporate service officer is also a black female. Uh, she is. Uh, she started in June, uh, and she's also made a massive difference already in the short space of time that she's part of a, um, a, a portfolio includes HR. And, and if if uh, once we release the HR forensics report, you will then should be able to see for yourself the horrible state that the HR function descended to. So she's rebuilding that. Uh, the chief financial officer, we are currently interviewing for that position. Uh, on Monday, we'll be doing the final interviews. The most important part, though, is that um, the chief executive officer, uh, the process did not yield a candidate for appointment. Um, and I have reported such to the minister, and we will have to now embark on a headhunting process. Um, the spec for the chief executive officer is quite high, and it should be high. Um, because this, this person must be able to interface with a variety of uh, stakeholders uh, and have a multiplicity of skills to be able to, to steer this fast forward. Um, the, the, of course, uh, members may be concerned about the fact that NISFAS don't yet have a chief executive officer. 
Uh, the minister and myself are discussing this in quite a bit of detail, and all of us are committed to um, not to drop the ball in that particular one. So uh, the minister will probably brief um, will probably brief the committee uh, soon on that particular matter. One of the key challenges that we have in this first is the amount of fraud and the ongoing discovery of additional fraud. Um, and two things uh, have happened is that, we, of course, we have part of my terms of reference was to do forensic investigations into fraud and corruption. And we have concluded all of that. Um, and we also have made sure that our hotline is functioning and we have a mechanism to deal with whistleblowers. Um, and just to illustrate, the caseload has been increasing as we as we have uh, as we as we start to implement some of these HR forensic, uh, some of, not just the HR but some of the forensics. I'll speak in general terms because you have the detail in front of you. So uh, first of all, uh, the HR forensics uh, recommended. Uh, that we take action against the senior HR uh, management that was there at that particular point. And there was a whole host of bad things that happened, uh, contractual studies, people receiving bursaries that didn't qualify, job gradings that got manipulated. But I think probably the most uh, important one for me is from this HR forensic, is that we discovered that in the during the term of the previous board, allocations were made to NISFAS to employ technical people. Uh, technical people like ICT, uh, uh, financial managers, um, you know, people that can run and that are fit for purpose for the NISFAS environment. And there a whole host of irregular appointments happened. Um, uh, 20 or more uh, senior managers were appointed, uh, and we subsequently found that they simply did not have the skills to do the work. Uh, and that is why one of the reasons why our security, cybersecurity was so bad and so penetrable easily penetrable. Um, and uh, we made those corrections. And in one particular case, one advert went out and five senior executives were appointed at a salary of 1.5 million rand each. And, and we have suspended these uh, irregular people that were regularly appointed because wherever we tried to make progress, we found that they were stymieing or hampering a process. I'm being very polite to a person, um, but we uh, these are some of the challenges that face us. Uh, in the HR space, coming coming back to fraud and corruption in its uh, uh, in its I want to say poor, purest form, but uh, coming back to fraud and corruption, you will recall that we have in arrested four people uh, in the beginning of the year for uh, cashing in students' uh, vouchers and and diverting it to their own to their own pockets. Now some of these people have turned whistleblowers. And it turns out that there are still syndicates running inside NISFAS that uh, that um, are defrauding NISFAS or also students. And I'll just describe two. The one is uh, where ghost students are created in cooperation with some, some people at some of the universities. And then those ghost students then get paid. Uh, and of course, the money gets diverted in that way. The other syndicate that we've uncovered is where uh, uh, students are bypassing the eligibility criteria, uh, the household cr cr um, eligibility criteria. And the way they do it is the students are sent to us as continuing students. And when you are a continuing student, we don't do another eligibility check. We only do elig eligibility checks at the start of the student's journey with NISFAS. So when we when they bypass the, that one and they designate the students as returning students, they can bypass um, um, the, the eligibility, eligibility check. Now, we have closed that loophole. Uh, it can't be done anymore. And of course, now we have access to EMAS data. We can see uh, students that are traveling in the system, and we are more effectively in clamping down on that. Another interesting development, as you will recall last time, that we uh, said that we have access to SARS data for validating income. Um, in the past, NISFAS used to use, used to use uh, credit bureau data. Now, credit bureau data is unreliable, unreliable by its very nature because people would inflate their salaries to get better credit scores and do a whole host of things or add uh, family income of, of children to, to the income to get better credit. But now that we have access to SARS data, we actually have the actual income of people. And not only just their salary income, but also their investment income and their rental income. 
and we have found, and I won't uh, put the number forward, but more, well, let me just say in excess of 7,000 people in the SARS system that should not have received NISFAS funding. Uh, we will be writing to them to, to ask them to explain the situation and where possible we will recover such funds. But um, but those are those are actually the three schemes that we are dealing with that are um, giving us a bit of a headache. Um, so, Chairperson, I know that I have probably gone on for quite some time. So in the interest of time, um, um, may, myself and my colleagues will be quite happy to take any questions on any of the aspects that was raised here. But, but once again, thanks for your kind, kind consideration and your attention. Um, thanks a lot. Um, um, thanks a lot for the presentation. And uh, all the members, we have had this presentation for a very long time. And uh, that's what is very good about the NESFAS. You really give us time to, you know, to put oversight on your documents and including also the department. Uh, you said something about, um, I mean, you know, in your presentation, though I missed quite a lot towards the end, particularly about the processes that are in place uh, for, you know, a normal structure. I don't know if, what is abnormal structure. Um, and that the appointments that we have made. And, uh, and we congratulate you. I mean, we've been, we're proud that we have also appointed women uh, with skills you know, and other men with skills will be able to take this, uh, uh, take an S fast forward. I just want to plead somehow that we need to also uh, look into the um, this uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, I think it's number five that talks about uh, empowerment of women in the, you know, and access to education. And that we said will promote, um, you know, women leadership. And uh, as part of uh, making the dream a reality, let us give, um, you know, uh, young women a preference in terms of um, uh, 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 what do they what are these things called? The, 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 the learnerships. Because learnerships are dependent on HR people. They decide how many people they want this year that they'll be able to, to you know, to, 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 to support and, and choose. So we, they need to take that into cognizance. And that will also go to the national department, uh, the, the, the Department of Higher Education and Training. Uh, honorable members, that's the presentation by the by the, the department and NSFAS. Um, yeah, it's for us to engage. Um, any comments? I would like to ask a question. Chairperson, hello. Chairperson. Yes, ma'am. Yep. I would like to ask a question, please, Chairperson. Oh, it's uh, to the uh, Honorable uh, uh, Dalmain. And the Tsuli. Oh, and uh, Honorable Tsuli. In that order, other follow. Um, uh, Honorable uh, Christian. Thank you very much, Chairperson. My first few questions, Chairperson, is to the Department itself. Um, I would just like to know about the 1 billion rand that was taken from University and TVET Infrastructure and Efficiency Grant, um, which was originally allocated for construction to new universities and um, TVET college sites. Now, what are the future plans to recover these funds to complete the intended projects? As we remember um, or recall not so long ago, um, you know, I recall one student, especially precious um, Ramabulani, that was murdered in Limpopo at, um, she was attending Capricorn Tibet College. Now, she was renting um, accommodation, private accommodation. And as the NISFAS administrator also uh, alluded to, you know, um, 
uh, accommodation is a huge issue for our students. Now, it is of particular concern to me that the infrastructure budget was cut. Um, and I would like to know what plans the department has in place to recover this then in the following few years. My second question is about the target of the 93,000 artisans also at TVET colleges. Um, how do you intend achieving that target with the lockdown and especially with the one trimester that is now being done away with this year? Another huge concern is the certification backlog at TVET colleges. Now, we all know that the certification has been a huge issue a number of years, but the department has indicated in the APPs previously that um, they are working towards a day zero where um, there will be no certification backlog whatsoever. Now, what has COVID-19? Has there been an impact? Um, will you reach your target of a day zero? Um, and will you actually be able to process your certification backlog in the coming few months, as you have indicated? My last question to the department um, is about the, the loss of curriculum development. Again, at TVET colleges for the year, um, as we know, the native courses um, in four, in five, in six are largely outdated. And uh, previously, it was alluded to that these um, the curriculums were being um, upgraded. Now, what impact has or will that have on um, curriculum development? And then also, I just want to know, will the department be revising their strategic plan and annual performance plan? And if so, um, when will they present that to us? To NISFAS, I would like to ask the following. Um, the administrator alluded to the tender process that was underway. Now, um, I would like to make a comment there and just, um, you know, comment to the administrator that the select committee be kept in the loop as to that tender process, because as we know, NISFAS has a history of um, terrible judgments. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, um, especially in the ITC systems and um, uh, the um, disbursement of, of funding to students. Now, will the select committee be kept in the loop as to that tender process and when it is finalized? And I would like to know about the wallet system that is currently being used. When that tender, when that new tender then is um, actually approved, are you no longer going to make use of the wallet system and why not? Is the wallet system then not sufficient or is it not working as um you are you have planned um i would also just like to mention that i'm glad to see that um NISFAS is taking hold of their hr issues that they are having at NISFAS, and that something is being done about that because that is of particular concern Hello, Christian. Yes. thank you very much Hello, chairperson Hello, i am Christian. done i'm christian i'm done chairperson Hello, Christian. Chairperson, I've asked all my questions. Chairperson? Yes, can I ask? Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chairperson, and my apology for joining the meeting late. Uh, I was, uh, yeah, my apology. But uh, the first presentation, I couldn't hear it because I joined late. No, but I can only just one... say because uh, she's still on the honorable tool. Yes, Chair. I'm trying to talk her to finish what she's saying because she has actually taken more time, you know, and that <laughs> if she switches a, 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 a video off, maybe her reception will improve. Okay. Honorable Christian, are you still there? Um, Chairperson, I, I am, I, I have completed all my questions, Chairperson. Yeah, I was saying that, yeah, yeah, if you switch on off your video, it will improve your reception because it's the major part of what you are saying. 
um, um uh, oh, okay. but I, I, just, I just get other the I just I just get other other I just get other people manage to hear. Maybe it was just my reception. Um okay. honorable the tool, it's your it's your time. Thanks. Thank you, Chairperson, and greeting to everyone. As I was saying, my apology for joining the meeting late. Uh, but um I have uh, two questions on NSFAS. Um on slide 15. Uh, of the presentation, it indicated that uh, NSFAS objected uh, to the suspension of uh, reallocation of funds for student devices. The matter is currently with um, National Treasury. What is the status of this matter? And the uh, second question, uh, uh is um, the adjusted budget amount uh, 38.55 uh, billion in essence it indicates an increase of 100 million. However, according to the adjustment appropriation bill on page seven, it indicates a budget cut of 5.5 million. Uh, can they kind of uh, clarify uh, the increase of 100 million? Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, you, you more than, you're more than welcome. Um, are there further questions from the members? Yeah, I'll say that, uh, um, DG, some of the questions as we go, because uh, of these problems with the, with the network, if members have other questions to ask, I think we'll end up having to do them in writing and then at some time uh, engage. I just want to check again um, that are there uh, maybe answers that you want to give or, you know, just responding to those remarks and questions? DG. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, my colleagues to come in, Dai and Aruna. Can you start, Dai, on the infrastructure? Perhaps it's only that question. I think the rest is for Aruna. I just want to check a little, a little bit. Uh, just, no, just before, ma'am, that on the issue of infrastructure, um, why is our... Um, you know, our estimation of how long will social distancing take in this country? Even if we were to, you know, let's say next year we get a vaccine, uh, COVID. Um, I think social just distancing is becoming engraved bit by bit into our genes. So the infrastructures that we are building, I think we should also look into uh, not only concentrating on bricks and mortar, but again building infrastructure that can make long distance learning much easier and better. And some of the courses that can be uh, given online could be given online. Now I'm raising this thing because I had a shock of my life. Last week, I met a teacher in my village at a high school who said they were having problems with children bringing cell phones at school. And what they decided to do was to encourage them to bring cell phones so that they can do the assignments on the phones. And, uh, and and it says they've been using Android phones and it serves all their purposes in that school. I need to go and visit them. It is a high school, but I'm just saying that they are actually learnings for us on this thing. You raised issues again with the discussions that you, the negotiations you went into with CSIR about, uh, you know, what kind of interventions can they I mean, the ways of, you know, like helping with the network and and other things, including even devices. I just hope that this information is, is, is shared by all ministers in education. I mean, you know, that this information and whatever uh, comes out of those, of those discussions should uh, also uh, 
you know, think about the basic education also in those uh, endeavors. Uh, thanks a lot, um, uh, uh, DG. The floor is yours. All right, Di. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members and uh, DG. Just in terms of the infrastructure program, um, the cuts that were made, the suspension that was made by National Treasury in the university sector was a total amount of 750 million and 250 million was returned back for um, utilization for um, uh, COVID responsiveness. So clearly 750 million is a, a, a large amount. It is from the 2020-21 financial year and had, it had already been allocated to a number of infrastructure projects across the system. So really the effect of this has been that um, those uh, infrastructure projects which haven't yet started won't start this year and we will have to move it out into later years of the empty. So um, we're starting a new infrastructure cycle beginning at um, in 2021-22 and going for three years. And we'll be utilizing some of the funding that will be made available by National Treasury in that MTEF to ensure that the institutions can implement those plans and those um, infrastructure projects that were already approved. So really the effect of this, and, and it is a disaster, none of us like the idea that we have to um, lose funding for important projects. But given this unprecedented time we're in and the disaster that we're in, these funds just had to be reprioritized. And so um, we do understand that. So it's not going to be a matter of the, these projects actually being uh, stopped. They will continue, but they'll continue at a later date. And in the long run, I suppose it means, uh, that's why we would indicated it means a slower implementation of the overall infrastructure planning um, for the system. Um, I think, uh, Chair, in terms of the comments you made, um, what COVID-19 has really done is it's really made all institutions, and I think this isn't only universities, it, it's, it's all our institutions, to consider alternative teaching and learning methodologies. Um, as was indicated by the DG in the plan, we have engaged with all institutions and all institutions have put in place what we've called remote emergency, multimodal teaching and learning plans. Um, and it's not just online learning. It's a, it's, a, it's a blend of different kinds of opportunities for study and for learning. Learning online on its own has also has its challenges. Um, and, you know, we, we're going to have to explore and understand how th this um, uh, works into the future. But one thing is for certain that all institutions have had to improve their um, learning management systems, their IT systems, and those will be strengthened into the, into the future. Um, we will be seeing far more blended learning going on, um, particularly, um, you know, uh, uh, mixes of face-to-face um, -face and online learning that will enable us, I think, to rethink quite, in, in quite a lot of ways um, the types of infrastructure that we uh, put in place. Um, the IT infrastructure being really important for the country um, as well as for the system. And one of the things there that's going to be important to look at is how we improve uh, connectivity. Um, you know, we've experienced a lot of these online um, platforms where we're meeting online and they are working, but we've also experienced quite a lot of challenges with the quality of our um, networks and and our connectivity. So that is an issue that's going to that's going to be there and that, that will need to be improved. Um, I think the other aspect um, in in relation to this and it links to this issue of physical distancing 
in, in the university system and in the department, we've talked about physical distancing rather than social distancing and social solidarity, because what is required now and possibly for the next 18 months or so until um, you know there is a vaccine, but even into the future, it may still be a situation as um, the world may experience more pandemics in the future. Um, what we've what we've learned is that people have to um, work together. We have to take cognizance of health and safety of everyone. Um, and this issue of physical distancing really changes quite a lot in the university system, particularly in relation to large class teaching. The um, a Gazette that the minister put out in terms of the return to teaching um, ensures that we don't have the kind of large classes that we may have had before. And this means that there has to be a rethinking in the way in which teaching and learning happens and the way in which we use blends of um, uh, information technology, IT technology, as well as um, you know, face to face small group teaching. So I think these are things that we're all learning about. We've, we've um, you know, had to use this actually opportunity that's been presented by uh, the pandemic and by the disaster to really um, explore and learn about how we can be in contact um, with students remotely and how we can um, utilize these kinds of methodologies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dai. Arun, are you able to come in? Uh, yes, DG, I've managed to sort myself out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, I have three questions from the Honorable Christians. Um, with regard to the infrastructure and what effect will the cuts have, um, you know, especially with regard to student accommodation. Now, just to clarify, the cuts on the infrastructure grant is um, the grant that is specifically uh, for repairs and maintenance. It is not for new infrastructure. It, 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 it is circumscribed in that way. So student accommodation or the building of student accommodation does not come into it because the repairs and the maintenance um, is prioritized for the learning spaces, for the teaching and learning spaces, because the money had to be devoted to a particular output. And in this instance, it's for the teaching and learning space, and it, is, it, it only deals with repairs and with maintenance and not with brand new infrastructure. Um, the cut um, uh, will have an effect, but not, not immediately and not, it will not be impactful. Currently, the colleges already have um, to the value of 2.4 billion transferred to themselves. As we've known from previous presentations, the, the colleges, the spend in the colleges has been extremely low thus far because there have been delays in the start of these um, uh, projects, even the plans. So there's enough money in the system for them to do the work they had projected to do both this year and next year. We are hoping that after two or three years that the, the allocation we have lost will be reimbursed. But if it's not, uh, what will be lost is the tail, the tail end of the list on the repairs and maintenance list. Obviously, the colleges will be asked to reprioritize their, their plans that they submitted for repairs and maintenance. So it is for that reason we said the impact will not be as dramatic as, as it might appear initially. The concern around student accommodation is a concern across the PSET system, and that is being dealt with quite separately in what we call the student, student housing um, program, infrastructure program, the SHIP program, as we call it. And uh, the minister has established a team to work exclusively with student accommodation, both in universities and TVET colleges, and to, to, to do this as a very future focused exercise where we'll be able to de deliver student accommodation to a much greater scale and to, to, to standards 
that would be preset. So that is quite a separate initiative uh, for student accommodation, and it runs across the PSET system. With regard to the certification backlog, a lot of work has been done. I just want to remind that our cert certification backlog, when this whole issue came about, uh, you know, the backlog, uh, we only looked initially at the recent few years as students began to query the, the, the outstanding certificates. But as we delved, the certification backlog correction exercise goes right back to around 1991. So it's a massive exercise. What we have done is we prioritize the certification backlog for the recent years, and we have made quite a lot of progress in that regard. When we look at the numbers of outstanding certificates, when we do report on them, um, it, the numbers might seem high, but many of them go way beyond the, the last maybe 10 years because there's a lot of reconciliation that is required and the students are not in the system anymore. For example, typical cases would be the same student having two ID numbers or one ID number relating to two different, a student with two different names, and there's a whole host of issues. But it suffices to say for now that we report very regularly. In fact, um, CETA um, has been asked to report fortnightly to the portfolio committee and uh, they track the progress and the, the, well, the, the reports come to the department and it is routed to the committee. So that is closely tracked and there has been much progress. Finally, in terms of the curriculum and the reviews, the, a significant amount of work has been done. Um, the curricula ha are ready. They are currently with the Quality Council for Trades and Occupations for them to review it. The intention was to implement as much of them as possible next year. It still remains our intention. The curricula will be ready, that we are sure of, to be implemented next year. The only thing that would stand in the way of actually implementing them would be whether we can do sufficient training of the lecturers because that would be a huge risk to introduce um, not brand new but updated curricula if lecturers are not properly trained to deliver them. So as it stands, it was in our, our, our plans to implement next year. We might not be able to implement everything that we had planned to implement uh, next year, but we would certainly introduce um, a basket full of um, updated curriculum, curricula into the NATED programs for next year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's back to you. Chairperson, do you want uh, Nesfas to continue? Um, yeah, it's your turn, Nesfas. Thank you, DG. Um, uh, and thank you. I've got all the questions, honorable questions. I've got all of your questions as well. But just to quickly respond to uh, the chairperson's comment on uh, a mentorship and, and learnerships. Nesfas do have a learnership program. Uh, where we take on board uh, 30 students and we train them. And we have developed mentorship programs internally to grow the internal staff. Because what uh, what we found is that there are often staff trapped at very low levels with actually quite high qualifications. And we are now providing career paths for them in this first. Uh, honorable Christians, the tender process. Now, we all have horrible memories of how things were done at this first. Um, but the process is designed for transparency. So first of all, the person that is in charge of that, that I placed in charge of that process is Mr. Prakash Mangre, who just made the presentation here. He's a previous chief financial officer from SARS, and he's used to the size of contracts, and he's also used to making sure that the PFM requirements are followed. We have also further built in further uh, oversight. We have asked this, the chief procurement officer to be part of the bid evaluation oversight as well as offic an official from DHET. We have requested the Auditor General to also pro uh, provide oversight. They are satisfied that our internal audit is sufficient. So we have both insufficient uh, oversight 
uh, to ensure that this very important tender don't go off the rails. But notwithstanding my comments, we will keep uh, the parliament bodies uh, as the oversight function abreast of the progress that we make and if there are any challenges. So that we can assure you. The wallet system, uh, the wallet system was always designed to be an interim measure. Only, it was only going to be for six months to assist those three colleges initially that indicated that they did not have the capacity to, um, to, to, to pay on to students. Now, the wallet system works well, but the wallet system do have challenges. And the best solution, I don't want to speak too much of the challenges because we don't want to give some of these uh, frauds to some ideas. But uh, the best solution to this is to pay directly into students' bank accounts. Because in that way, you also secure an additional layer of security, which the bank account offers. And also you have then also the flexibility of managing your own account. So the wallet system is working fine, but the bank system is the ultimate solution. The HR function, uh, we have, we are rebuilding the HR function. There were no systems. We are now, we have spec'd a system for uh, HR. The payroll was, for instance, outsourced. But one of the things that we are thinking is a big step forward is we have moved all employees to the Government Employment Pension Fund. They were on a very, very bad pension fund. Um, so bad that one lady, after a long 10 years or more at NISFAS, only left with 150,000 rand or so. So at least the new entrants and some of the people that are still young in the system will benefit from this move to the Government Employment Fund. Now, on the uh, Honourable Natuli's question on the objection from NISFAS, uh, we are working with the DG and National Treasury, and we believe that that uh, onerous uh, uh, clause uh, will be able to be dealt with uh, very soon. Um, I have, on, upon request from the Minister, set up a meeting with, uh, with the DG of Treasury and myself and the DG of DHET to make sure that that don't become an obstacle. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Mangra just to talk to the question on the adjusted budget, uh, the 100 million vis-a-vis -vis the 5 million, um, and then I think we have covered all of the NISFAS questions. Thank you, Administrator and Honourable Chairperson, and Honourable Members, uh, and uh, specifically to your question, Honourable Lutuli. Um, the, what appears on the slide to be a budget increase of 100 million, the actual change is a net change of 38.4 million. And the 38.4 million net change is made up of the three items uh, that I described earlier. The one was the once-off grant uh, of 36.1 million for the four items of once-off expenditure. The second was the 7.8 million rand cost of administration from 1 April to 20 August. And the third was the 5.5 million reduction. Those three items, honorable chairpers and honorable members, uh, nets out to 38.4 million. The total expenditure originally was 378 million. It is now 417. So that is a net change of 38.4. So it's probably in the rounding off that the team did when they presented the slides and showed it as zero point, and uh, it appears to be one decimal, uh, 100 million, but it's actually a net of 38.4 on those three numbers. Thank you, uh, Honourable Chairperson, and Honourable Members. Your Honourable Members, are, they, are you done with the answers, uh, DG and your team? No, certainly. Are uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Chair, we, we've dealt with all the, uh, the questions and the, the matters that we needed to, to clarify uh, for, the, for the meeting. With all the pressures of load shedding, you know, et cetera, as we indicated earlier on. Thank you, Chair. I'll say that, yeah. No, thanks, sir. Are there questions from members? Even though we are not fewer in the meeting than we were before or earlier. Um, I'll say for my side that uh, um, thank you all for uh, having you know briefed us about what is happening now with the with the adjustment. Uh, uh, this uh, 
adjusted budget for me and I think for the committee, it is fit it it it's fit for purpose. And I think it will help us to go through uh, this storm until we we get time where we'll do the you know uh, you know do 